When it comes to super heavy armored behemoths like the mouse and the E100, there's certainly plenty of arguments why these tanks would never work, and I do outline some of them in my video dedicated to Panzer 46, which you should check out if you haven't already. However, these tanks do have their proponents, and one of the most important reasons that they give for these tanks actually being viable and useful is their thick armor. Indeed, the mouse and the E100 had very thick armor, over 200 millimeters in some places, uh, and the argument is that it doesn't matter if they were quite slow, they could just trundle around at their leisure like mobile bunkers, and essentially they would be invulnerable to any weapon developed by the Allies, um, and even if they could only drive at a pedestrian space, they could simply drive all the way to Moscow while shrugging off hits from enemy guns. Well, the thing is, there's no such thing as invulnerable armor. Uh, especially in wartime, development of weapons goes very quickly, and so in a year or two or three, a tank that was considerable, considered invulnerable previously uh, is now facing down weapons that can destroy it at quite a long distance away. It happened to the T-34, it happened to the Tiger, um, it would have happened to any tank given enough time. And unluckily for the Malice of E-100, the Red Army actually started working on weapons powerful enough to destroy it all the way back in 1943, even without knowing that such a tank was ever on the drawing board. The thing that kicked off the development of these super powerful guns was actually the discovery of the Ferdinand Tank Destroyer during the Battle of Kursk, Kursk 1943. Uh, if you think about the progression, it is quite frightening. So in 1940, the most powerful German tank that the USSR was aware of was the Panzer III with just 30 millimeters of armor. In 1941, they encountered the Stug and later Panzer III's with 50 millimeters, so the armor almost doubled. Uh, in 1942, well, very early 43, they discovered the Tiger. The armor was front armor was 100 millimeters thick. It doubled again. And then in July of 1943, they discovered a Ferdinand with 180 millimeters of front armor. Essentially, the armor doubled, doubled, and doubled year over year. And while nobody was expecting a German tank in 1944 to show up with 400 millimeters of armor, this was still a very concerning figure uh, because, well, the tank that came in 1944 might not have. 400 millimeters of armor, but it's still going to have more than the Ferdinand, and existing Soviet weapons were barely enough to take the Ferdinand out. So development of new, very powerful guns had to begin, and it had to begin quickly. Now, as far as the platform for these guns, there was really only one option, the ISU-152. The ISU-152 came as a successor to the SU-152, which already proved itself as a potent tank destroyer. Uh, interestingly enough, also during the Battle of Kursk, um, there was uh, two SPGs, one nicknamed Zveraboy and one nicknamed Zubr, uh, from the 3rd Battery of the 1529th um, Heavy SPG Regiment. And these two uh, SU-152s came up against Tiger tanks from the 503rd uh, uh, Heavy Tank Battalion, and, well, made short work of them, and so the nickname Sveraboy, meaning Beast Slayer, or Beast Killer, or Beast Hunter, sometimes translated as, um, actually came to mean, to refer to all SU-152s. Um, the SU-152 was of course based on the KV-1S chassis, it was taken out of production in late 1943, when the KV-1S was replaced with the IS-2, uh, sorry, IS-1 and then the IS-2, um, and so only the ISU-152 was available um, as a platform when all of these guns became available for installation. So, what did these weapons actually look like? Well, there were three calibers that were considered. Um, one was 130 millimeter, which was interesting because it was not a caliber used by the land forces. One was 122 millimeter, and one was 152 millimeter. Let's start with the 130 because it's, like I said, probably the most interesting one. The 130 millimeter gun was based in the ballistics of the B-13 naval gun. Uh, the B-13 was actually considered a quite powerful weapon, and it was pitched as a bunker buster back in 1940 during the Winter War. It was installed on a self-propelled gun called T-100Y, based on the T-100 chassis, uh, and it was supposed to tackle Finnish fortifications, except the war ended by the time the gun could actually be installed. So the T-100Y never saw any combat, and that gun, well, it just kind of sat there. Um, but in 1943, when a new more powerful weapon was needed, hey, here you go. We had some ideas for a gun that was already 
built and installed and well might as well reuse them so uh vasily grabin's central artillery design bureau got to work on a new weapon that they uh, gave a new index to the it was called s26 the vehicle it was installed in was very creatively called isu-130 the prototype was due in April of 1944, but the gun was only delivered in November of 1944. Uh, by December, it failed trials and had to be returned to Graben for improvements, uh, most notably a tougher barrel. Because of the high muzzle velocity of 100 meters per second, it wore down very quickly, uh, which was not really satisfactory for the army. Uh, the gun returned to trials in May of 1945 um, and actually gave pretty good performance. So at 100 meters, it could penetrate 250 millimeters of armor. Um, and at 1,000 meters, it could penetrate al almost 200. So a very potent weapon um, against German tanks. Uh, the trial notes did mention the fact that, hey, the 130 millimeter caliber is not actually in use by the land forces. But the performance of this gun was powerful enough and promising enough that they said, hey, we can consider introducing it. It might be worth it because of how good this gun is. Um, interestingly enough, the S-70 gun later designed for the uh, I-7 tank had the exact same ballistics, so it fired a 130mm shell at 900 meters per second. So clearly, very promising weapon, uh, and if there was need for it, well, it could have made it into production um, and on the battlefield a lot sooner. Next, the 122 millimeter gun. Um, the Soviets actually already had a pretty potent 122 millimeter gun, the core level A19. Uh, this gun was considered a powerful weapon that could potentially be used against enemy tanks as early as 1940. And when the German Tiger tank was discovered, it was of course used in trials and had a very good effect against its armor. Uh, the A-19 gun was later adapted for installation in a IS-2 tank as the G-25 um, and into the ISU-122 tank destroyer uh, under the designation A-19. And the D-25 was adapted as well um, into the ISU-122S, which was received then on index D-25S. Um, actually covered development of that gun in both my books. Uh, the IS-2 development, design production of Stalin's Warhammer, uh, where I talk about the Z-25 and the IS-2, and Achtung Tiger, where I talk about how these 122mm guns were used against the Tiger tank. But now, the armor of the Ferdinand was much thicker than that of the Tiger, and the armor of the Ferdinand's potential successors would be thicker still. And so the D-25's muzzle velocity of 781 meters per second was not considered sufficient. Um, the level that the Red Army decided to go up to was 1,000 meters per second. And so development began of actually not one, but two guns that had that kind of power. One received the designation OBM-50. Uh, OBM stands for Astobe Bashoi Moishnisti, Special High Power. The OBM-50 was designed for installation into SPGs, uh, and the OBM-51, which was never built, uh, was designed for installation into tanks. Now, the, um, the gun was actually renamed from OBM-50 to BL-9, which is probably, if you've played World of Tanks, that's how you uh, you know about it. So uh, the BL-9 was a very, very powerful weapon at a muzzle velocity of 1,000 meters per second. It could penetrate over 200 millimeters of armor, which also made it a very, very potent weapon against German tanks. The BL-9 was completed much sooner than the S-26. It was finished in July of 1944 and submitted for trials in August. Unfortunately, um, during trial, during testing um, to simulating um, barrel wear using supercharged shells, the barrel burst. And so it was rejected on those grounds and returned for improvements. A more robust design was submitted in April of 1945, and it actually passed preliminary trials in May, so it was considered a very promising design. Uh, Graben also submitted a 122mm gun with a muzzle velocity of 1,000 meters per second, um, but similarly to SS-26, this gun was actually even called S-26-1, um, it failed its initial stage of trials in November, it was returned for improvements. And in the summer of 1945, an improved version was installed in an ISU tank destroyer and was actually undergoing trials. Uh, both tank destroyers 
with the 122mm guns were referred to as ISU-122BM. BM stands for Bishoy Motion Steel or High Power. And last, but certainly not least, we have the 152mm gun. Uh, the 152mm gun was also based on an existing field gun, the BR-2. Uh, now, actually, unfortunately, couldn't find any penetration figures with BR-2, uh, but it was used on a series of Soviet bunker busters before the war, none of which reached mass production. Uh, and there were some designs to put the 152mm BR-2 in the SU-152 uh, in late 1942. So... The Red Army was clearly very aware of this gun's power, and it was considered as a candidate for use in tank destroyers. Um, there were two projects, again, developed in late 1943. Uh, one was called OBM-43, and it was a 152mm gun with a muzzle velocity of 100 meters per second, um, which was installed would be installed in a tank. And then the OBM-53, the 53 would have been installed in a tank destroyer, but it was otherwise almost completely identical. As before, the weapon for design intended for a tank, it was never built. Uh, the weapon intended for the SPG was renamed to BL-8. Um, and actually, the BL-8 was built but never installed in a, in a vehicle. A superior version was developed called the BL-10. The BL-10 had a faster... Uh, semi-automatic sliding breech, whereas the BL-8 only had a manual screw breech. So the BL-10 was installed in an SPG called ISU-152BM, and, well, this story might sound familiar to you. It was delivered for trials in August of 1944. Um, it failed trials because the barrel was insufficiently robust. It returned to trials in the summer of 1945, um, and the trials report that I do have is uh, refers to it as a pretty promising vehicle um, that was going to make quite a difference in the armament of the Red Army. The muzzle velocity was reduced a little bit compared to um, the initial plans to a 26 meters per second, which still gave pretty good results. It could penetrate up to 240 millimeters of armor at 100 meters and 205 millimeters of armor at a kilometer. So Again, a similar power to the other guns we've discussed, and definitely very powerful and very useful against any German tank that uh, it could have possibly encountered. Now, it's worth mentioning uh, another SPG under testing at the time, the Object 704. Uh, the Object 704 was a reimagining of the ISU-152 concept, but on the chassis of the IS-3 heavy tank with heavily sloped armor for additional protection. Uh, the Object 704 was armed with a 152mm gun howitzer called ML-20SM. Uh, as the name implies, it was a modernized version of the ML-20S gun howitzer used in the um, ISU-152. And even though games like World of Tanks let you put a BL-10 into uh, the Object 704, uh, that combination was never actually built because both the uh, Object 704 and the BL-10 just remained prototypes. So to summarize, uh, by the summer of 1945, the Red Army had not one, not two, not even three, but four different tank destroyers on the ISU-152 chassis, uh, all of which had a gun capable of penetrating over 200 millimeters of armor. Now, by that point, there wasn't really a worthy target for such a weapon, and none was found until June of 1945. Uh, in fact, it's not until June 29th that a report is made to Stalin that describes a new super heavy tank that was found uh, near Meppen. Um, that was, of course, the Mouse tank. Uh, the Mouse was seemed very interesting since it was the heaviest armored tank known at the time. And it was evacuated to Kubinka, and it underwent penetration tests there, uh, and various other analysis of its armor and its components. Interestingly enough, the armor was very thick, but the quality of it was fairly low. Um, and as a result of the penetration tests and the examinations, there was a penetration table composed for the mouse's own 128mm gun, uh, the IS-2's 122mm gun, and the 100mm gun uh, used on the SU-100 and T-54 tanks. Um, now, the muzzle velocities for penetration given for penetration in that table were not largely not achievable by the D-25, but higher velocity 122mm guns, such as the S-26-1 and PL-9, could in fact penetrate the mouse in several places. Uh, now, the 
upper front plate, uh, the velocity of penetration was 1300 meters per second, so it would still not be able to penetrate that armor even with the higher power gun. But the lower front plate and the turret front were much more vulnerable. So the turret sides and the lower front plate were actually of fairly similar toughness. Uh, they required a velocity of 920 meters per second to penetrate, which equals uh, about 1000 meters range with the BL-9 or the S-26-1. Uh, the front of the turret was weaker. Uh, it only needed 825 meters per second to punch through, which meant that these two guns could penetrate it at 2000 meters. Uh, the rest of the mouse's armor was even thinner than that. Um, so as you can see, uh, it was vulnerable to the S-26-1 and the BL-9 guns tested on the ISU-1-2 BM tank destroyer. The ISU-130 with its S-26 and the ISU-152BM with its BL-10, uh, they had comparable power, so really any of the four guns that were being tested would have been useful against the mouse at a fairly long range. So as you can see, uh, as a result of starting work on large high-power guns that could defeat the Ferdinand successors, the Red Army actually ended up with four guns that could defeat German super-heavy tanks, including the Maus and the E-100. Uh, unlike the Maus and the E-100, which were both cancelled in 1944, development on these high-power guns continued, and by the summer of 1945, the Red Army had four very promising projects that, had the war not ended, would have been taken to their completion. And if a German super heavy tank did appear in the battlefield in 1946, their army would have been more than ready for it.